Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this video we are going to be looking at Cenozoic Earth history. So we're going to focus on the Paleogene, the Neogene and the Quaternary, so we're pretty much covering everything. So let's get going. So what's happening in the Cenozoic? Well, the Cenozoic is, extends from 66 million years ago to the present day. So the 66 million year boundary, essentially the boundary between the Cenozoic and the Mesozoic, is marked by the KT mass extinction. So I'm sure you remember that's when an asteroid smashed into the Yucatan Peninsula, of what is now modern day Mexico, essentially producing a nuclear winter, which of course did significant damage to life on Earth. So we can see a very significant shift in the life, obviously, in the Mesozoic, we've got species like ammonites and dinosaurs present in the in the fossil record. And then all of a sudden, as we pass over into the Cenozoic, those species are gone. So until recently, the Cenozoic was actually split into the tertiary and the quaternary. So here's the quaternary up here. And so all of this time here was actually called the tertiary. Now the tertiary essentially would have been a very, very large unit. So from a geologic point of view, it was actually a little bit, you know, difficult to use. You know, because if you just said, oh, it happened in the tertiary, well, that's quite a lot of time you're dealing with. So what happened was, is we split the tertiary up into the Paleogene and the Neogene, just to make things a little bit easier to work with. So in terms of what's happening for North America, it's actually quite a quiet time, tectonically speaking. Obviously, there's still some stuff going on, which is part of the Laramide orogeny, and that's going to finish in the Paleocene. Some more recent work suggests maybe it finished in the very early Eocene, but probably the Paleocene. And then there's a little bit of rifting, there's some, you know, a little bit of volcanism, but really, that's pretty much it for North America. It's a very, very quiet time. So what we're also going to touch on today is we're going to have a look at some of the what was going on in a more general global view as well. So in terms of the tectonic overview, well, what was going on? Well, during the late Cretaceous, Pangaea had completely fragmented into the modern day continents. And of course, during the Cenozoic, they are going to be migrating towards their present day positions. So during the Paleogene and Neogene, these spreading ridges that were established during the Mesozoic actually help to move the continents towards their present day positions. So what's going to happen is, is we're going to see a changing climate though during the Cenozoic. So what's going to happen? Well this changing climate is going to be more on a local scale. So just think about this. So imagine during the very early Cenozoic we have a situation where Africa is not in contact with Europe and Asia and South America is not in full contact with North America. So this essentially means that warm water from somewhere like the Indian Ocean can travel between Africa and Europe, it can go into the Atlantic, then it can travel between North America and South America and go into the Pacific, and then come all the way back to the Indian Ocean. So essentially we have a global circulation of warm water along the equator. Now this is obviously going to affect all the ocean basins because you have a nice supply of warm water going into them. Now, what's going to happen as we go into the Cenozoic is, you know, as these continents begin to migrate northwards, well, Africa is eventually going to make contact with Europe and Asia, and North America and South America are eventually going to join up. And so all of a sudden, what you're going to end up with is essentially the Indian Ocean Basin, the Atlantic Basin, and the Pacific Basin. And so this means we have now isolated them to some degree, and so they're now going to have their own localized um, environment. So, what we, you know, so we're going to see that as we go through the Cenozoic, and it's going to have quite a big effect on global climates because all of a sudden we're going from a you know a homogenized-ish global climate to a climate where you know the ocean basins are operating as isolated systems, and that affects the environment that they produce. So in terms of what was going on, as discussed during the Eocene epoch, you can quite clearly see that Africa is you know, pretty well away from Europe there. And we can see that South America and North America obviously are not um, attached to one another. So we can see we have a nice free circulation of water going between these ocean basins. And that would have helped to keep you know, ocean basins like the Atlantic and the Pacific slightly warmer. We would have had very warm water coming from the Indian Ocean here, traveling around the equator helping to keep these ocean basins a little bit warmer than they are now. Now by the time we make it into the Miocene which is up here in the Neogene period, 
we can see that Africa is now making contact with Europe and Asia. We can obviously see that India has made contact with Asia. And we can see that Australia is currently migrating northwards towards its current position. We can see that South America and North America haven't quite made contact there. They're ever so close, but not quite. But essentially what's happened is, is now the warm water from the Indian Ocean all of a sudden can't make it into the Atlantic. And so what we end up with is we end up with a bit of a situation where the Atlantic starts to become isolated, for obvious reasons, and we begin to see a bit of a temperature drop in the Atlantic. And the same thing happens in the Pacific as well, but obviously the Atlantic and Pacific can still communicate to some degree, so that helps to you know, affect, you know, limit the effect a little. Okay. So, you know, in terms of what was happening for the North, uh, Northern Hemisphere continents, where we can see Europe has pretty much not moved, Asia has pretty much not moved, and North America is migrating westwards. So, in terms of what was happening from a global tectonic point of view, we have two, essentially, orogenic belts. Now, you know, these orogenic belts are essentially several orogenies all linked together to form, you know, one long semi or, you know, continuous or semi-continuous belt of, you know, tectonic activity. So we have two of them. One of them is called the Alpine Himalayan belt and the other one is called the Circum-Pacific orogenic belt. So in terms of the Circum-Pacific orogenic belt, this is the one we're most familiar with. So it's called, also referred to as the Ring of Fire. And it starts all the way down here at the southern tip of Chile. And we come all the way up through South America, through, uh, through Central America, through North America, across the Bering Sea. Then we come down you know, in, through Western Russia into Japan. And obviously we have the Philippines. Then we come around here to Papua New Guinea. And then we come all the way around here, you know, past Tonga and Fiji. And we eventually go past New Zealand. And away we go. So this is one you know, pretty continuous belt of subduction and, you know, lots of volcanic activity. Now over here we have the other orogenic belt which is the uh, Alpine Himalayan orogenic belt. So this is ever so slightly different. So what we have here is we have what is very very soon going to be a continent continent collision here. We definitely have a continent continent collision here and here we have an ocean continent collision. Well actually eh, is it ocean continent? Yeah it's ocean continent. Yeah, the, the underlying crust here is mostly continental. So what we end up with is you end up with a belt that on the whole has a lot less volcanic activity because there's a lot less subduction going on. So, you know, we have some volcanic activity in Europe. We have some limited volcanic activity in, you know, in, you know, in Asia Minor and in Asia. And obviously we have lots of volcanic activity down here as you move into Indonesia because obviously that's a proper, you know, convergent subduction zone. So, you know, there are slight differences as we can see. So the Alpine uh, belt obviously starts over here in northwestern Africa, and it continues all the way across southern Europe into what is sometimes referred to as Asia Minor, and then into Asia itself. And then it's often assumed that this belt ends in the Himalayas, but it doesn't actually. It continues down through Southeast Asia and into Indonesia. Okay, so those are our two belts. So, okay, so let's have a, a bit of a think about some of the mountain ranges and what's going on. Okay, well, what's, you know, we're going to talk about the Alps. So the Alps are the result of the deformation along a zone stretching from Spain to Turkey. So we obviously get concurrent deformation along Africa's northwestern margin. So when you have two you know, continents moving towards each other, you don't just form mountains on one side you'll also form corresponding mountains on the other side. So both pieces of continental crust will start to build up mountains. So the Alpine orogeny is actually rather complex. So although Africa and the Arabian Peninsula moving north is an important part, we also have the collision of several smaller land masses which are positioned between Europe and Africa and that helps to complicate the issue because normally you would assume you know, kind of like India meeting Asia, it's just one piece of continental crust meeting another piece of continental crust and bang. In the case of Africa heading towards Europe, that's not the situation. So if we look down here at this image in the bottom left, what you'll notice is between Africa and Europe, so Europe is you know, this mass here, 
we actually have southern France, which is this lump here. We have Spain and Portugal, which is this lump here. Italy is going to be this lump here. The Balkans is going to be this lump here. And this is going to be a bit of Greece. So what you can quite clearly see is we actually have several small masses of continental crust in between the two continents. And so what we're going to see is as Africa moves northwards and the oceanic crust gets subducted along a subduction zone, which is crudely here. Well, these small pieces of continental crust, they're going to make content, uh, contact with Europe before Africa even gets involved in the collision. So what that means is we're going to actually have a set of individual smaller collisions along here, and then Africa's going to start getting involved. So it's quite a complex situation. Now, in terms of the in terms of you know the main mountain range that we know about during this period the himalayas well that one's relatively straightforward that is india just crashing into asia so india began its journey during the early cretaceous when it separated from gondwana so we can see in this diagram down here that about you know 71 million years ago now remember 66 million years ago is the boundary between the mesozoic and the cenozoic so this is in the mesozoic okay India was, you know, pretty much in the middle of what we refer to as the modern day Indian Ocean. And slowly between 71 million years ago and the present day, India has been steadily migrating northwards. So what was going on? Well, there was a subduction zone that was running here along the southern margin of Southeast Asia. And this was obviously subducting the oceanic crust between India and Asia. And this oceanic crust was subducting northwards underneath asia so there would have been <clears throat> a mountain range here in southern asia kind of similar to the modern day himalayas nice big mountain range lots of volcanic activity now then what happened is is slowly but surely india starts to move northwards now remember although you know this is you know they're showing modern day india here there would have also been a mass of continental shelf to the north of you know what is now modern day india so don't forget that. So when we think about India hitting Asia, we tend to think about India hitting Asia as, you know, the modern day India making contact with Asia. But in reality, there would have been a whole load of continental shelf to the north of what we consider to be modern day India, which would have started making contact first. So just bear that in mind. So this means that the collision itself actually started about 50 million years ago so the collision is beginning when india is pretty much all the way down here because there's a whole load of continental shelf on this northern margin of india right here that's starting to interact with the continental shelf or well, with the continent of asia and so we begin to see this continental shelf on the northern side of india beginning to buckle a bit and we begin to see a corresponding deformation in Asia here. So, you know, that's why the formation you know, in the beginning of the Himalayas isn't actually when India proper makes contact with Asia. It actually starts well, well, well before that. So, uh, between about 40 and 50 million years ago, obviously India's drift rate begins to decrease. Okay, so we begin to see around this point, around kind of this point here, India starts to slow down. And obviously that's the first indication that we know of India beginning to make contact with Asia. And we know that's going to be the continental shelf to the north of what we consider to be modern day India. And obviously the, you know, the collision between the two results in the modern day Himalayas. Now, how do we know that you know, there was a collision between the continental shelf and Asia? Well, we know that because we actually have sedimentary rocks very, very, very high in the Himalayan mountain range. So as you're heading towards the top of uh, Mount Everest, um, you'll obviously see a lot of rocks like granite, but there will also be within that sequence fossiliferous limestones as well that have been pushed all the way up due to the collision. Now these fossiliferous limestones would have been on the continental shelf that was on the northern margin of India. And so when the collision happened, obviously, we had the two pieces of crust come together and that continental shelf got squished and included into the mountain range and some of those rocks got pushed up as part of the collision. 
So in terms of the drift rate we begin to see, we begin to see India's drift rate begins to decrease from 15 to 20 centimeters a year to around 5 centimeters a year. So that's a pretty big change in drift rate. Okay, so here's a general view of what's happening in the late Cenozoic. So what can we see is going on? Well, during the late Cenozoic, we can obviously see North America and South America definitely separated from one another. We can see South America is going to be moving westwards. North America is moving westwards. Now, please remember at this point, 105 million years ago, North America and Europe are still technically attached to each other. I know it doesn't look like it in this diagram here, but they are still technically one unit. So that means the North American continents are still moving as one mass. Now, North America is trying to go westwards, and eventually the rifting that's taking place here will allow it to do so. Now, in terms of Africa, we have a subduction zone running along here. As we can see, we have lots of very complex, small pieces of continental crust, which will start to smash into Europe one after another, forming several smaller orogenies. Okay, so, you know, for instance, we have things like, you know, the... Um, the erogenies associated with the collision of Spain and Portugal with Europe. We have erogenies associated with, you know, Italy making contact with Europe and so on. So the, Al the Alps are actually, you know, quite a complex situation made up of lots of small individual collisions. In terms of Africa itself, it's moving eastwards. It's moving northwards. And so what this does is it begins to force Africa to rotate. What you'll notice is Africa isn't quite in its current day position. It's going to rotate a little bit more anti-clockwise, and then it's going to be set up in its you know, current orientation, and then it's going to start drifting pretty much northwards. In terms of Madagascar, Madagascar rifts off the side of India, and India itself begins its trip northwards, courtesy of this subduction zone right here. Australia is still connected to uh, uh, Antarctica, but we can see here the rifting is beginning. So eventually, given, a, given enough time, Australia will separate away from Antarctica. Now, obviously, we can see we have a mountain range running all the way down here. So obviously, this is telling us we actually have an active subduction zone here along the western margin of North America and South America. And that's what's allowing these continents to move westwards, combined with the pushing force of the divergent plate margin here running down the center of the Atlantic. Now, by the time we're in the Eocene, so about 50 million years ago, what can we see? Well, the situation is you know, a lot more like present day, isn't it? We can see that Africa is you know, steadily moving towards Europe. So please note, by the way, this is this continental shelf that I was talking about to the north of the continent. So India had exactly the same thing. So if we just go back, you'll notice that there it is. This is the continental shelf to the north of India. So this material is going to start making contact with Asia well before the main mass of India actually hits. So that's why we see this sudden change in the, the drift rate of India about 40 to 50 million years ago, because that's when this mass of material starts to hit India. So what's going on? So, of course, yeah, Africa is moving northwards. India continues its nor northward movement. Australia is now fully rifted off Antarctica, and that too is now going to steadily move northwards, once again, courtesy of the subduction zones right here. It's going to slowly pull it in a northerly direction. In terms of North America, well, by now, North America has fully rifted off Europe, and it's also fully rifted away from Greenland. So Greenland's now its own mass. Europe and Asia is now its own mass. South America and North America still aren't in direct contact. So you can see we, we kind of have the ability to circulate water all the way around the equator. And so this helps to keep the ocean temperatures a little bit warmer than you would expect, a little bit warmer than now. So, okay, what's happening with regard to the Laramide orogeny? Well, we know the Laramide orogeny is the final phase of the Cordilleran orogeny. So if you remember, we have three phases. We have the Nevadian, we have the Sevier, and we have the Laramide. So if you remember, the Nevadian phase is kind of the classic you know, ocean continent subduction phase. We have oceanic crust subducting under continental crust, and of course that produces a, you know, a mountain range very similar to the modern-day Andes. So big mountain range full of volcanoes, very close to the coast. 
Now then what happens if you remember is the angle of subduction of the oceanic crust under North America begins to become shallower. Now this means that the oceanic crust essentially begins to start you know, grinding itself against the base of North America. Now this pushes the tectonic deformation further inland. And so this leads to a shift from, you know, more kind of classic ocean continent subduction to a situation where we have lots of tectonic stresses being emplaced into the crust. And so we see with the Sevier erogeny, we see a shift to crust faulting, big crust faults associated with the Sevier. A little bit of volcanism as well, but a lot of the stuff going on with Sevier erogeny are big crust faults. Now then we're going to steadily see that oceanic crust become, you know, the angle of it become even shallower. So even more of it is grinding along the bottom of North America. And so we're going to see another shift in the tectonism. And so the Laramide erogeny is going to, is going to be mostly associated with very, very large, very, very open anticlines and synclines. And also a lot of normal faults pushing blocks of rock straight up. So, as you can see, each one of the three orogenic events has quite a distinct feel to it. So, in terms of the Laramide, we know it began in the late Cretaceous, and it's going to continue through to the middle Paleogene, possibly the Eocene. So, the orogeny was not focused at the trench itself, instead it was focused very, very far inland. That's why the, the Rockies, if you look at them, are actually a very, very broad set of mountains, because as the orogeny, you know, as the Cordilleran orogeny itself was taking place, the Nevadian part is close to the coast, then the Sevier part is, is even more inland, and then the Laramide portion is even further inland, so that's why the Rockies are such a broad set of mountains. So the erogeny itself was not focused in a region proximal to the trench because that's you know was that was the Nevadian erogeny. So this differs, of course, from the majority of subduction zones. Think of the you know the Andean erogeny where you have the Nazcar plate subducting under the South American plate. So in so in this case, we're not going to get the complex you know folding and thrusting and volcanism that we see normally. The Laramide is going to be a completely different type of erogeny. So instead we get these blocks of rock being pushed up and we get these large broad anticlines and synclines and on the whole we get pretty much no volcanism. So to account for the eastward shift uh, the adjustments had to be made to the, to the subduction zone model so you know obviously most subduction zones function normally you know like the Andes. So this steady shift eastwards has to be accounted for. So we know that the Nevadian erogeny takes place at the coast, we know the Sevier erogeny takes place a little further inland, and we know that the Laramide erogeny is even more eastwards. So during the Nevadian and the Sevier um, erogenies, the subducting Farallon plate was descending at approximately 50 degrees, so a kind of relatively standard angle of subduction. And that obviously meant that the, the Farallon plate was subducting down to around 150 to 200 kilometers. We know what happens. It begins to melt, producing magma, and the, you know, well, dewater, should I say, which melts the mantle, producing magma, which starts rising up and, you know, obviously feeds volcanism at the surface. The standard kind of model. Now, what we know is by the late Cretaceous to early Paleogene, it's thought that the angle of subduction had you know, essentially decreased significantly, and it was near horizontal. So this means the Farallon plate isn't subducting, it's just grinding along the bottom of the North American plate. Now, as we've discussed, that leads to a very significant change in the tectonism, but of course it also means that the Farallon plate is never making it down to that 150 to 200 kilometer depth, so that means no melting of the oceanic crust, or more accurately, the mantle around the oceanic crust. So, why that happens is you know, a bit difficult to explain. You know, so why does the Farallon plate not subduct at the normal angle? Well, the first possibility is maybe there's, you know, something like a, a buoyant ocean plateau attached to it. So on the seafloor, there are actually some quite large regions of plateaus. So essentially, they're areas of raised seafloor that have a flat top. 
and some of them are really, really quite large. If you go on Google Earth and have a look around, you'll actually spot them pretty quickly. Now, if you were to try and subduct one of these things, well, there's a good chance they wouldn't actually subduct that easily because, you know, they, they would want to try and stay upwards because, remember, the thicker the crust, essentially, the more buoyant it becomes, the more it wants to stay up. So if you try and subduct a very thick piece of crust, like a piece of continental crust, which you remember, continental crust does not subduct because obviously one of the reasons is because it's so thick. Well, when you try and subduct a very thick piece of seafloor, well, it's going to be pretty difficult to subduct. It's going to naturally want to rise up. And so, you know, a buoyant ocean plateau might explain why the Farallon plate didn't want to subduct at the standard angle. So that's option number one. Option number two is that we have a mantle plume stuck underneath the Farallon plate. So normally what happens is mantle plumes are big balls of magma, and we know about them, you know, we know about them because they form island chains like Hawaii or the Galapagos Islands. And we know these mantle plumes come shooting up, and, you know, they produce, you know, these you know, basaltic, mag uh, basaltic uh, island chains which we see. Now, most mantle plumes will actually get stuck beneath divergent plate boundaries because it just the reason for that is that the the way convection is working in the mantle it just naturally encourages them to come up below these divergent plate boundaries however every once in a while a mantle plume just does what it wants to do follows its own path and we can see that with in the case of hawaii you know that's a mantle plume just going where it wants in this case into the middle of the pacific so in our situation now, what's going to happen is, imagine a mantle plume getting stuck beneath the Farallon plate. Well, when you try to subduct that piece of oceanic crust with a mantle plume underneath it, it's definitely not going to subduct. Because a mantle plume is a naturally very buoyant thing. It's going to want to rise. And so it's going to push up the oceanic crust that it is stuck underneath. And so that's going to naturally make the oceanic crust extremely difficult to subduct. And that would lead to the shallowing of the angle and eventually the oceanic crust becoming horizontal. And now that's you know, quite a nice simplistic model. So the mantle plume model is kind of the preferred option. I'm going to be honest right now. So now we know about the change in, in deformation, so we're not going to talk about that. And we know about the shallowing and the loss of volcanism. Okay, so by the middle Eocene to Paleogene, the Laramide deformation had ceased and igneous activity returned. And this renewed activity is thought to have been due to the mantle plume uh, underneath the Farallon plate breaking through it. So remember, the mantle plume is much, much hotter than the oceanic crust that it's stuck beneath. So eventually, what is it going to do? It's going to burn through it. And so as soon as, the, as soon as the mantle plume burns through it, well, what happens is then is the mantle plume gets stuck under the continental crust of North America. And then subduction returns to normal. All of a sudden, the oceanic crust snaps back to its original position and starts subducting at around 45, 50 degrees again. And now when that happens, oceanic crust makes it down to the magic 150 to 200 degrees. Uh, kilometer mark and then everything you know the mantle melting and the magma rising starts you know as usual now in terms of the mantle plume another reason we think that the mantle plume you know mantle plume was probably involved is because when the farallon plate goes back to normal subduction that happens to coincide with a, a sudden spree of flood basalt eruptions into the uh, western uh, onto the western side of north america and so this sudden release of flood basalts onto the western side of North America is a good indicator that there's a mantle plume somewhere nearby. And that you know, would probably explain the change in the angle of subduction of the Farallon plate. So, you know, we see things like uh, the Colorado Plateau is a nice example of a you know, flood basalt system. So that was absolutely huge. It went all the way from, you know, the, uh, the central rocky states like Colorado, and it went all the way to the west coast so that's a lot of magma being erupted so okay so that's kind of the model and then, so the mantle plume model is the preferred situation as you can see it kind of ties in quite nicely with what we see geologically 
So of course, this is our model. So here's our mantle plume. It gets stuck beneath the uh, Farallon plate. Now at the moment, it's not really going to affect it. So things are subducting at around 45, 50 degrees. Now, as soon as this mantle plume gets, essentially enters the subduction zone, well, this piece of oceanic crust is going to start getting pushed upwards, isn't it, by the buoyancy of the mantle plume. And so we end up very, very quickly with a situation where we have the mantle, pl mantle plume forcing the oceanic crust against, the nor against North America and just essentially having it just grind along the bottom of North America horizontally. Now, at this point, what happens is the tectonic... Uh, tectonic forces which were focused over here more towards the trench suddenly get spread out throughout this entire region and so we see the spreading out of these tectonic forces in the form of the laramide orogeny which form which forms right here and that's when we get these big anticlines and synclines forming and these normal faults which start pushing up large chunks of rock now then what happens is eventually the mantle plume is going to burn through the oceanic crust and the oceanic crust will then start subducting again as normal and then the magma from the mantle plume will start making its way through the continental crust and then we will see the deposition of flood basalts or should I say the eruption of flood basalts which we see in the form of things like the Colorado Plateau. Okay, The Colorado Plateau is a pretty decent sized flood basalt terrain so you know there was a good amount of magma being erupted so you can see pretty much what was going on and if in the bottom left here you can see the timings and you've got a geologic time scale over here so you can you know see what was going on in terms of where it falls with regard to epochs okay so i think this is a good place to uh, stop the first part of the video so once again stop the video get up have a walk around, get a drink of water, cup of coffee, cup of tea, whatever works for you. And then please come back for the second half when you're ready.